Well, amen. Come on, let's put our hands together for what God is doing this morning. We're so excited. Well, hey, before we go into the message, we want to have some Father's Day fun. We know it's Father's Day. We thought we'd switch it up a little bit because how many of you know today is the day, if you didn't know this, today is the day you can unapologetically let the dad jokes fly, okay? Some of you are like, that's every day. But today specifically is the day you can let them fly. So we thought we'd have some fun. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have Pastor Luke and Pastor Cam come on up, and we're going to have a head-to-head dad joke battle. The way that this is going to work out, <laughs> don't make a mess already. Just <laughs> The way that this is going to go is that when we start the game, our pastors are going to fill their mouths up with water, and I have here arguably the best or the worst dad jokes, and what we're going to do is whoever spits out the water, the other person gets a point. So I know what, I know what this section right here is thinking. <laughs> this is a splash zone. But don't worry, if you look under your seat, you'll realize that there's nothing underneath them. <laughs> Good luck. And so here we go. Boys, I want a clean fight, okay? As clean as it can get, do not spit on me, okay? So here we go. How many of you are rooting? This is okay. We can take a vote. How many of you are rooting for Pastor Luke? <laughs> that didn't sound too good. <laughs> well, wait, let's give it a second. What about Pastor Cam? No pressure. <laughs> it's the hair, isn't it? I get it. It's the hair. Everybody thought that was Brandon Lake. Okay. <laughs> it's a good look. Oh, all right, go ahead and take your swigs. Are we ready to see this? Are we ready to have some fun today? Some of you dads, I'm going to load you up with gold today. You're welcome. You're going to be in the car and be like, guess what I heard at church? <laughs> okay. Did you just take a sip? You know you're supposed to keep it. Okay, here we go. It's just... <sighs> All right. Here's the first one. Y'all, I got to focus. Y'all be laughing. All right, first one. How do you get a country girl's attention? You have to attract her. <laughs> That was close. Hey, when does a dad joke become a dad joke? When it becomes a parent. <laughs> that guy really liked that one over there. He was like, oh. What kind of music do chiropractors like? <laughs> Hip hop. Just don't spit on me. Just don't spit on me. Um, I was going to tell you guys a time traveling joke, but you guys didn't like it. <laughs> That's one point for Cam. <laughs> I was wondering which one was going to be the one that gets him. <laughs> I was gonna, you back up, don't. Don't look at me when you've got the water, you're gonna spit on me. All right, take another swig. What's Forrest Gump's Wi-Fi password? <laughs> one, Forrest, one. <laughs> We're tied up, that counts. I'm counting that, one each. They're rooting for you, bro, you, got, you can't let them down. All right, okay, first off, you guys know who Erica Badu is, right? You know Erica Badu? All right. Do we, we all know? Okay. You know she fell down the stairs recently, right? She's Erica. Badu, 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 Badu. <laughs> That's my favorite one. That is my favorite one. And if they didn't laugh at that, I was going to leave. <laughs> With that, it's a tie. One more. One more. All right. At least you don't have to shower when you get home. All right, last one, last one. <laughs> we could go all day. That's why they have to give us a time. They're like, you got three minutes. Otherwise, we know this is what Father's Day at the Bridge would be. Okay. You know, Michael Jackson started. A d d hang with me. D stay with me. Stay with me. It's not going where you think. 
Where? <laughs> Michael Jackson recently opened a denim store. He called it Billy Jeans. <laughs> Pastor Luke is the winner. Oh. All right, grab your glasses. We're going to clean this up. Y'all make some noise for our pastors. Great job. We just want to say happy Father's Day to all the dads. Let's go ahead and give a big shout and celebrate all our dads in the house today. Come on, we love our fathers. Happy Father's Day at the bridge, everybody. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hey, uh, happy Father's Day, dads. And for those of you watching online, special welcome to you as well. Dads, just so you know, when you leave here today, uh, we have uh, packages of beef jerky or beef sticks available for you. Uh, they have a dad joke attached to each one of them. This one happens to be voodoo chili. If you like really hot stuff, that's the one you want to get. If you can't take pain, you don't want to grab the voodoo, okay? Just telling you. Uh, so this one says, why do cows have hooves instead of feet? Because they lactose. Now, now, dads, I'll tell you, the more you groan, the happier we are. So uh, anyway, guys, you want to make sure, dads, you want to make sure that you grab those on the way out. If you don't, that will be a missed steak. <laughs> You're welcome. Now we got some uh, fun things today. By the way, can we just give it up for creative team and for those guys just doing that. So much fun, so much fun. Uh, it's great to be here with you today. We're continuing our series. Uh, began uh, two weeks ago talking about heaven. A lot of people want to know about heaven. It's, we, people talk about heaven. It's in popular cultures. Everywhere you look, somebody is writing a song about it, making a movie about it, talking about it. And so uh, this has been like a really key uh, series for us to jump into. A few weeks ago, I kind of gave an overview of heaven. Last week, I talked about how to experience heaven's power here and now. And, and this week, I'm going to be talking about heaven's rewards. And it's going to be a crash course. Now, let me just say this, that next week, I'm doing a Q&A. So if you have any questions at all about heaven, make sure you email them to creative at bridgechurchfl.com. Take a picture of it, write it down, but don't ask me any questions about heaven afterwards. Ask them beforehand because we're going to compile all those questions, take those and be able to answer as many of those as we can next week. So you'll want to make sure that if you have any questions at all, that you send that in. And you know, one of the great things about heaven, and as we look at the convergence of Father's Day, and some of you are fathers, some of you are not fathers, but here's the, here's the truth. This beautiful thing is that God is, is the father that you've always wanted. God is the father who loves you like no other. God is the father who is able to bring into your life what you need. And, and, you know, good fathers, they, they, they encourage their children. Good fathers love their children deeply. A part of that love is that, is that discipline and direction that fathers give. It's the, it's, the, it's the casting vision for your life about why your existence is so beautiful, matters so much, and the beautiful things that God could do in you and through you in your life. That's what good fathers do. God does the same thing for us as well. And so just so you know, right off the top, God loves you. You matter to him. And he delights in being a father to everyone who comes to faith in Christ. And he loves everybody and invites everybody into a relationship with him. And that's one of the beautiful things about following Jesus is, is this, this relationship that we get to experience. And, and God is always teaching us, always teaching us. And today what we're going to take a look at is probably one of the most important things that, that you can understand if you place your faith in Christ, kind of what, what does that look like? How, how, does, how does God work in your life? How does he take the things that you do and make those count? We're going to look at that. Now, a few years ago, my wife and I, uh, 2017, 2018, we did a massive remodeling project on our house. And in that remodeling project, 
uh, you know, we, it, that all started because we had a porch uh, in the front of the house, and I noticed a plant growing from underneath the porch, like in between the wood. And so I had somebody come by, take a look at it. They dropped off the plywood panels, and he said, you got maybe five years left because there's so much rotten wood up there that now it's becoming like soil for plants to be able to grow in. It was a, ba it was a bad, bad moment. But it wasn't just that. Our oak trees had pushed the concrete up in our driveway so much that one day when I drove over, um, it kind of rocked on top, the, the concrete rocked on top of a root, and it bounced up, and it smashed the bottom of my engine. And I went, okay, I think we're at the point where we need to start doing something here. And it was amazing, because when, once we began the remodeling project, you begin to discover a lot of things, right? Anybody ever done a remodel before, been through that? You find a lot of things when you start taking apart things in the house, right? And so one of the issues was they, they pulled all the drywall. We took the house down to the studs in a lot of areas. And, and there was one drywall where it just began to get this stained look to it uh, from the back side of it. When they opened it up, it turned out that when we had, a few years earlier, had an air conditioning unit installed in the wall that they had driven a screw into the drainage pipe from the upstairs toilet. Which meant that every time we flushed the toilet, it started getting into the wall. Another time, I remember talking with one of the electricians. He says, hey, let me show you this. And he pulls out an electrical outlet that he had taken out of the wall, and it was all scorched on the side. And he said, hey, take a look at this. And he said, this was shorting. He said, I don't know how that didn't start a fire. It happened to be in our boy's bedroom where the boys grew up. And it was like, oh, my goodness. You begin to find things when you start taking apart the house. You find all kinds of hidden stuff. Now, thankfully, the foundation was good. So since the foundation was good, we were able to build using that foundation. And, and one of the things that, that our Heavenly Father encourages us to do is to actually look at your life just like you would look at a house. Begin to take a look at the kind of life you're building. Begin to consider the life that you're living. Understand that when God looks at your life, he looks at it just like a builder looks at a house. And that you actually are a builder. You're building something with your life, whether or not you realize it, you're still building something. And so there's an invitation from God for us to be able to see what God sees. And when you see what God sees, then you're able to live life the way God created you to live it. And so before we jump into this passage, I just want to take a moment, let's pray, and let's open up our hearts. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are truly the Father we've always wanted. God, there's nobody like you that's loved us like you. Sending your son Jesus to die on a cross to pay for all of our sin, past, present, and future. There's no one like you, God, that delights in forgiving us of all of our sin and then coming into our lives in a personal relationship. There's nobody like you then who inspires us to do good things and then rewards us for those good things. God, that's all a mind blower to us. So God, today, our hearts are open to you. Help us to see what you see, and help us, God, to live lives that will really make a difference because of a new way of understanding, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, and everybody said? Amen. Amen. So the Apostle Paul wrote, to, uh, wrote a letter to the church in Corinth, and uh, the church in Corinth was made up of Greek people that had become followers of Jesus. They weren't Jewish people, so they didn't have any background at all in the Old Testament, in the prophets, in Moses, none of that. All of this was new to them. And so the Apostle Paul is trying to help them to understand how to look at their lives the way that God looks at their lives. And so here's what the Apostle Paul writes. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 Starting in verse 10, he said, because of God's grace to me, I have laid a foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. He's talking about the, the foundation he laid of ministry, the foundation he laid of helping people to understand God's love for them through Jesus. And he says, now others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation, the foundation of faith in Jesus, must be very careful, very 
careful. Now, I can tell you that all through any building project, whether it's out here with Love Built This or, or whether it's at my house, Manatee County makes sure you're going to be very careful. They're going to send inspectors to make sure you're doing it and doing it in a very careful way. Paul says it's no different with life. You should be very careful about what you do with your faith because it matters. He said, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials. Take your pick, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. He says, but on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. Now notice what's being tested here. Okay, it's, it's the work, it's, it's, the, it's the actions. He says, the fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a what? A reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. And so the Apostle Paul paints a picture to, to give us a framework to be able to understand how to look at our own lives. And there are several things when we talk about the truth about heaven's rewards that you need to know. Number one, first and foremost, is this. Salvation is God's gift to you, but rewards are earned by you. Salvation is God's gift to you, but rewards are actually earned by you. Let me make this so clear for you. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, said it this way. He said, God saved you. That is, God forgave you. That is, that God adopted you, that God brought you into relationship with himself. God saved you by his grace when you believed. God saved you when you believed. Believed what? Believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior, that he took your sins upon the cross, not just everybody's, but your sins on the cross, that he paid completely for the penalty of sin through his death, that he, he died, was buried, and was raised again from the dead. He says, when you believe that, that's the moment when salvation starts for you. He says, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. It is a what? A gift. Can you earn a gift? The answer is no. You can earn a wage. You can earn a lot of things, but you cannot earn a gift. If you earn it, it is not a gift. It's a wage. And, and this is really important because this is where people often have become confused by their religious backgrounds. Sometimes you've heard religion talked about and the relationship with God talked about like this. If you're a good enough person, if you do enough good, God will love you. Well, he kind of loves you now, but you've got to make your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. And if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then you will go to heaven, hopefully. How many good deeds do I need to do? I don't know. But you're, they better weigh out, and you better get that right. And, and, and the problem is, is a lot of people grew up with that kind of a religious message. <laughs> And the problem with that is this, there's never any joy in a relationship like that because everything is driven by the wrong things. And you live with a sense of, but I know I'm not good enough, I know I'm not good enough, how can I know if I'm good enough? I don't know, how can I know? You can't know. And when you know yourself, you realize I can't, I can't earn it. I can't be good enough. If God knows my thoughts, I'm doomed. And so it has to be a gift. It's the only way. And, 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 and that's what God, your father, wants you to know. It's a gift. And a gift is given because the giver wants you to have it. So God doesn't want you working to earn your way into his good graces. God literally wants to give you a gift. 
And that gift is salvation. So Paul makes it very clear. He says, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation, look at the next statement. Salvation is, matter of fact, say this with me. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. Period. Can't be, ever. Look what Paul goes on to say a few chapters later in Ephesians 6. He says, remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do. So here's how that works. The moment you place your faith in Christ, your sins are now forgiven, past, present, future. So when we talk about judgment day, for Christians, that's not an issue. And I'll tell you why. Because judgment happened when God allowed his son to die on the cross. That's where the judgment that you deserve and that I deserve went to. Jesus took it, absorbed it, said, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that for you. And so once that happens, now you live your life as a fully forgiven, dearly loved child of God. Now what are you going to do with that life? That's how it works. What do you want to do with that life? And so here's the second thing that you need to understand is that God is looking for opportunities to reward you. Any good parent... When when you're parenting your children, you are the one that is to recognize the the, the strengths and the weaknesses of your child, the potential of your child. A good parent calls out of their children the good things that they see, right? That's good parenting, right? I used to to look at my boys, and, and when they would do something good, I'd say, man, I saw what you did there. That was so good. I'm so excited about what you're doing now because it makes me think about what kind of a man you're going to grow up to be one day. So what we do is we we call out the good in our kids and help them to see their potential. God is no different. God sees the potential that you and I carry as bearers of his image, people made in the image of God to be like him. And he sees that, so he's looking for opportunities to reward you. When the Bible talks about judgment, for believers, it's not judgment for sin. That's been dealt with. It's some, the word that is used is actually the word for what we do in the Olympics, which is we have a podium. It's called the Bema judgment in Greek. It's B-E-M-A. Bema judgment is this. When, when, when we watch the Olympics and they've got the platform, do they take the person who was in last place and put them on a platform and flog them and embarrass them? No, why? Because that's not what it's for. The Bema judgment is a place for reward. That's what it is. And this is what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. He's saying judgment day for the believer is a judgment of what you did with your life. It's not a judgment about sin. That's already been dealt with. And God is always looking for opportunities. Look at how God is looking for opportunities so much. Look, even in the smallest way, Matthew 10, 42 says this, Jesus wrote, uh, Jesus said, if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose what? There were a cup of water, a cup of water. You mean something that minor? Something that minor. Now, if he's looking to reward somebody for something like that, what does that tell you about his heart? He's looking for every opportunity to be able to reward you. How how does that happen? Well, some of the reward that you get is going to happen for things that you do directly. So, for instance, collecting food, bringing them to the food bank like you guys do. Some of you, your small groups, you get involved in things in the community. Judy's small group, Community and Connections, they'll go out and they'll partner with different ministries and serve. Some of that is direct. Some of it happens right here in this building uh, when you get welcomed, when, when worship team is up here and they've, they've poured their heart into uh, being able to lead us into a sense of the presence of God. Uh, the people on production that are pushing buttons and are the puppet masters. They are able to to do direct ministry. People upstairs uh, that are up there even now. Uh, People that are holding doors open. People that are serving in children's ministries. People that are doing direct ministry. Not only here on this campus, but for those of you that use uh, marketplace ministries, where your work is your primary place of ministry, where you look at your job not as a job, but as a ministry to help people. 
and that you do what you do because you realize I am, I am God's representative in the marketplace. And so I wanna make sure people know how much God loves them by the way that I do my job, the way that I speak to people, the way I talk about people or don't talk about people. I want people to understand that. So there's, there's always opportunities for direct ministry that you do. God sees, sees everything that you do, all of it. And he goes, I'm going to reward that. I'm going to reward that. Oh, yeah, when you wrote that, that letter of encouragement to that person, when you took that, that fellow coworker out to lunch because they were having a bad day and you encouraged them, let them know you were praying for them, Wow, when you fed the homeless through one of the ministries that you partnered with or did it yourself, I'm rewarding that. I'm rewarding that. When you put food on somebody's table that they wouldn't have had otherwise, I'm rewarding that. God is always looking for opportunities. God is also looking to reward you even for personal devotion that nobody else may see. Here are some things. I'm just going to give you a machine gun uh, list here. So these are things that God says he'll reward you for. Jesus said all these things. God will reward you for seeking him through fasting and through praying. God will reward you for submitting to your employer as a faithful steward, looking at God as being your boss, not your earthly boss, but looking at God as being your employer and, and doing your job to please him. God will reward you for self-denial that you make in service to him. God will reward you for serving those in need in his name, helping people to know, I'm just showing you God's love in a practical way, helping people connect the dots between the good things that you do and why you're doing it. God will reward you for suffering for his name and his reputation. Let me tell you, as a follower of Christ, if you are living your faith in any way that can be seen, at some point you're gonna get criticized and you're gonna be persecuted, you're gonna be judged by somebody. It's going to happen. And when it happens, God sees it and goes, oh, well done, well done. Now there's, there's one exception to that, there's an asterisk. You don't get any credit for being a jerk. <laughs> and going, oh, I'm being persecuted for my faith. Now, if you're a jerk, you got to come into you. <laughs> be gracious. Be kind. Right? So there's that, those rewards. There's, there's a reward. Check this out. God will reward you for sacrifices you make for him. In fact, Jesus said that every person who sacrifices to follow him will receive a hundredfold reward. God will reward you for sharing your time, talent, and treasure to further his kingdom. So there's direct things that you do directly, God sees, but it's even better than that. And this is gonna be one of those moments where you're gonna put your fingers together like this as we go through this, and all at the end, we're gonna have a mind-blowing moment, okay? Listen to this, Matthew 10, 41. Jesus said, whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Now, here's what he's saying. Because in that culture, when you receive somebody, that's how you supported them. You receive, because they didn't have, you know, we, online giving, didn't have any of that. So the way that you supported a ministry was you let them stay with you. You fed them. You encouraged them. You prayed for them. You received them into your home. Receiving somebody was the way that you communicated, I'm supporting you. And so he says, when, when you, if you, anyone receives a prophet, because he's a prophet, because he's truly a prophet of God, will receive a prophet's reward. What is that? Every life that is changed and transformed because of what the prophet says, the prophet will get a direct reward for. But whoever received, whoever received that prophet and supported the prophet will also get credit for what the prophet did. And so you then get credit for the results of the prophet's ministry. When you see a person who may not be a prophet, but they're going to do good in the community because they want to show God's love in a practical way. When you support the person who's doing good, they're a righteous person, you will receive a, that righteous person's reward as well. You will also receive the blessings and the rewards from God for the results of their ministry of kindness. So think about these things. Let me show you. So let's take a look at the way we do this as a, as a people of God here. 
So we've got different ministries that we partner with because we believe in what they're doing. This is how ministries that we've received. So we partner, for instance, Love Built This. We're gonna be building out here in this open space, inviting environments where people can find hope. Everybody that gets drawn in, that God works through, that is able to benefit from the environments that we build, every life that has changed from inviting environments that we build, every life that is transformed, everyone that experiences breakthrough, you will actually receive reward for that when you're a part of supporting Love Built This. You receive the profit's reward. Here's the truth. If you go back in time, this place was built in the 70s. This church was founded in the 70s. Those people that sacrificed, that actually stood on this piece of property when all it was was a big pile of sand and weeds and scrub brush, those people that invested in that and those that had invested all along receive the reward for every single life that has been touched and transformed for the, through the ministry here. How many is that? How many is that? I don't know. Think about this. Association of Related Churches that we're a part of. The Association of Related Churches has planted in 20 years 1,000 churches. 1,000 life-giving communities. Every single life that is transformed through the ministry of every one of those churches. Now, we've been in partnership with them for, uh, since about 2007. Every church that was planted. So we've been investing in there, investing in there, investing in them. Every church that is planted for every ripple effect that comes from that, every person that comes to Christ, every family that's, trans that's transformed, and every one of the ripple effects that comes from every changed life and every changed life that happens because of changed lives and other changed lives that happen because of changed lives that are changed by changed lives because of those churches being planted, you'll be rewarded for Get ready. 2,000 children in Swaziland, Children's Challenge. 2,000 children that we feed every week. Those children, by the way, is so important. It's the highest AIDS death rate in the world has been in Swaziland. More orphans per capita than any nation on the face of the earth. And so we feed those kids because it takes them out of trafficking so that they have a meal. They also get an education and they learn about Jesus Christ. The goal is to help those kids to know Jesus and to help those kids be able to work out of a, a poverty situation by getting their education. And we feed them to make all that possible. We also dug a well there. That well just means the world to a community is able to transform a community. We've dug wells, we've bought a truck for the food to be delivered and we supply the food and, and recently you guys took care of their budget for the next three years, I think it is, through your generosity. Every one of those. How about bring on the ministry? Bring on the ministry, mobile shower unit that goes into our homeless community here to give homeless people a sense of dignity. That's something that, that you guys, God's generosity through you was a part of, of, of doing that. Every life that is touched. If God is looking at even a cup of cold water to reward, he's also rewarding showers too. We also have the Blessing Bags Project with Betsy Plant, working with the homeless right here in our community. Touching them, showing them God's love in a practical way, helping them to find hope in Jesus Every one of them. Now, here's the deal. I'm not going to go out on the streets and, 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 and spend time with the homeless. That's not what I'm called. Doesn't mean that it won't ever happen. Doesn't mean that it can't happen just as I'm going about my day. But I'm called to, to preach and to teach. Betsy is called to do what she does. And she's doing it for you. If you're not doing it, she's doing it for us. Everything that she does you get credit for and reward for because you support her. We support her through our giving here. How about one more child? 
One more child, showing God's love in a practical way by meeting the needs of foster children, trafficked children, hungry children, single moms, and struggling families. By the way, they're not just here in Palmetto. Their home base is in Lakeland, and their ministry is actually global. So when we support them financially, which we do, every life that they touch all around the world, God knows each one, and you receive reward for that. His girl's discipleship right here in our community believing that women deserve a second chance. And every woman whose life is transformed through the discipleship, through the love that they experience, through having a place to stay and to learn and to grow, every one of them and the, their children that you end up impacting because of that and their whole future, you're a part of that. And then here's the one that Pastor Lucas alluded to, but we can't actually tell you their names for security reasons, we can't. But they were here just a few uh, uh, weeks ago. And let me tell you about this couple. So our partnership in Greece is this, is that the couple that we support, they are in Greece to serve Muslim refugees. The Muslim refugees come from Syria, they come from Afghanistan, they come from different uh, places that are experiencing conflict. And what is happening in the Muslim population is absolutely unbelievable and incredible. As a matter of fact, in the, the, uh, around the world, right now, the fastest growing Christian churches, Christian communities are actually happening in Iran, where it's illegal to be Christian. The fastest growing ones. And what happens is, is that, is that uh, in, 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 in the last 20 years, more Iranians have become Christians than in the previous 13 centuries. In 1979, there was an estimated 500 Christians from a Muslim background in Iran. Today, the estimate is hundreds of thousands. Some estimates put it over a million. I actually went to seminary and, and, and studied with, a, with somebody who was from the Middle East to go back to do ministry secretly. And so what, what this couple does is they minister to the Muslims in a camp, and he was telling a story of Afghan refugees. And he said, what's happening is this, and this is a very common story when it comes to Muslims, is that Jesus comes to them in a dream. Muslim, in a Muslim faith, dreams and visions are actually an accepted part of their faith. And he said, what's happening is Afghans are coming to Christ in the most powerful ways. And he says, what they're doing is, he says, you have never seen joy like on the face of a Muslim who's come to know the love of God and the grace of God. And even though they know it might result in their death, they go, I want to go back to Afghanistan because I'm going to share my faith. And he said, the most joyful Christians you ever see are Afghans who've come to Jesus and are going back to give their lives. He said, it's unreal. And so here's what I want you to know. For, for, because of our investment in what God is doing around the world, even in the Muslims, your investment is changing lives in the most incredible ways. And for every person that chooses Christ as their savior, that we're in partnership because of your giving and our giving to them, you actually receive reward for that. Now, how many people do you think that's gonna add up to over time? But here's when you're gonna find out. Check this out. Luke 16, nine, Jesus said this. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and to make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, that is when your time on this earth is done, they will welcome you to an eternal home. What? People that you don't know whose lives you touched through either direct contact or vicariously through ministries that you support or that you're a part of somehow being able to support them, there's gonna come a day when you're gonna actually meet the people whose lives you touched. And you're not gonna know them here, but you're gonna meet them up there. 
And this is one of the things that your heavenly father and my heavenly father is looking forward to so much is that day when you get to see the impact that your life and my life made. And so use your worldly resources to benefit others and to make friends. God is looking for opportunities to reward you. Here's the, here's the third thing that you need to see is that when it comes to what you do, your why matters. The reason that you do what you do matters. And so here's some tests to be, that you need to be aware of. The Apostle Paul said this, going back to the passage that we started with, but on the judgment day, which is not a day that Christians should ever be afraid of, but on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. So there are three tests to keep in mind about the good things that you do, the good things that I do, three tests that you always want to keep in mind to make sure that what you're doing doesn't get burned up, all right? Number one is this, the motive test. The motive test is this, is do, am I doing this to bring honor to myself, to look like a good person, to look like a great guy, to even to look like a good Christian? Am I doing that to bring honor to myself or am I doing this to bring honor to God because I want people to see God? And this is where helping people to connect the dots makes a difference. When you do good for somebody and they say thank you, you say, I just wanted to show you God's love in a practical way. Help them to connect the dots why you're doing what you're doing. And then when they say to you, well, you didn't have to do that, that's when you say, I know, that's what makes it so fun, right? If I had to do this, it wouldn't be any fun for either of us, but I don't have to. It's called grace. Just like God gives me grace. Help them to connect the dots. So the motive test is important. Why am I doing this? You will know by how you feel when people give credit to you. If people give credit to you and you're like, ah, oh, that's great. That one burns up. If people give credit to you and you say, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm doing this because God is in my life. Now you're good. So you want, to make, you want to check the motives. Do I bring, am I doing this to bring honor to myself or honor to God? You know how you're doing by how you respond to people's feedback. Here's the second thing is the movement test. What is it that gets you off center from just sitting and doing nothing to then actually taking action? You can be motivated by guilt and pressure and do it because the preacher hammered on you because you were told you better do this. and you, Hey, listen, I've, been, I've talked to people that said that, that they've been in church and when they were growing up and they would pass the plate and when he got to the end of the aisle, the, the, the usher would look at it. If it didn't have enough, he'd pass it right back down the same aisle again and say, try again, <laughs> right? So, and then the people hopefully feel bad enough to put more in there. So you can be motivated by guilt and pressure or by concern, joy, and love. What creates movement in you? What does it take to create movement in you? Guilt and pressure, when you operate out of that, that's coming from a place where I don't want to do this because I got to hang on to what I have. I don't feel like I have enough. I don't, versus, oh no, God, you're my source of abundance for everything. You lead me. Where do these resources go? It's totally different. Matter of fact, here's how the Apostle Paul says this. 2 Corinthians 9 starting in verse seven. And he's talking about giving in church, as a church. He says, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. Where do you decide it? In your heart. Like, what's in your heart? And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. If you feel like you're being pressured, you shouldn't give. Whoa. If you feel like, I don't really want to do this. He's like, it's not how you want to give. Why? It's, it might not, might not help you. Now, here's what I found personally. There was a time when I really was reluctant about it. And, and, and I learned that, you know what? There's a point where I just go, I'm going to trust you, God. Help me to understand this. And so you can give so that you can understand what God does. 
But Paul says, don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. Now look what he says. For God loves, enjoys, delights in a person who gives what? Cheerfully. The freedom. Why? Because there's a freedom. The person who gives cheerfully goes, you're my source for everything, God. You're, the, you're my provider. You're my supplier. And you bless me so much. And so when you bless me, God, help me to know the best way. Help me to know the best way to channel the resources that you give me. Help me to bless those who need it. God, you just show me because you're the one that provides everything that I need. And so sometimes you hear the phrase, give until it hurts. Don't ever give until it hurts. Give until you laugh. Because that's when you're cheerful. That's when you found freedom. That's when you're walking in the grace and the goodness of God and all of your giving is coming from a beautiful place. And Paul said, and when you give cheerfully that way, he says, and God will generously provide all you need. And check it out. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others because God sees you then as a conduit, as a pipeline to channel resources where he wants them to go. And he knows he can entrust it to you because he knows you're not going, oh, it's all mine, right? And when he sees it, he can entrust you with it. He's like, oh, good, I'm gonna give you more. I'm gonna, okay, take this and then and give it, okay, take this and, and give it to them. Okay, take this, give it to them. Take, and he can do that with you because he knows you're not hanging on to it for yourself, but you're just seeing yourself as a vessel for God to work through. So take all of this information, all of these things. Here's the one principle and takeaway that you need to latch on to. No matter what, this is what you want to remember today. Everything you do today matters forever. Everything you do today matters forever. Everything that you do today is an opportunity to see heaven not merely a destination, but a destiny that your heavenly father is saying, let's shape your destiny together. Don't just wait to go to heaven. Shape it. Look forward to it because there are great things that are going to be there, but you play an important part of this. And as our heavenly father, he goes, son, Daughter, don't be passive about this. There's so much beauty that waits for you when you begin to live your life knowing that I'm looking for an opportunity to reward you eternally. You're already my son. You're already my daughter by your faith in Christ. And now I want you to begin to think about what you're looking forward to. Set your sights on the realities of heaven because it's gonna be a great day. When I come back and I take you home and you get to meet people that you didn't know whose lives you touched, you get to, you get to see the fruit of a life that is well lived. You get to enjoy what I enjoy. Transform lives forever. So our heavenly father says, don't waste your life. Don't waste your life as a Christian. Just kind of going, I'm just going to do my thing, come in, check in, check out, and do that forever and ever until I one day pass away. Don't do that. He's like, no, no, no. Plan for it. Invest in it. This is your destiny. You get to enjoy what's ahead. But the way that you do that is by investing here. And it's not just financially. It's your time. It's your talents. It's your abilities. And God's like, it's going to be amazing when you are welcomed by all the people whose lives you've touched. And guess what? Somebody touched your life, and you're going to welcome them. And they'll begin to experience all the lives that you touched as well. And so Jesus says this, Matthew 16. He says, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. I'm coming back, guys, is what he's saying. And then he will reward each person according to what they have done. He's saying, don't treat heaven as a destination. 
This is a destiny that God himself is looking forward to with you. And so make your life count. Start. Do things to point people to Jesus. Help people to find hope. God created you. And you exist because God had decided that the world would be a better place with you than it ever could be without you. And he invites you into a place of walking with him and being able to discover your purpose. Now, next week, we're going to be looking at some of the questions that have already come in. I have to do with some end time stuff, judgment stuff. We'll take a look at that. So we're going to continue to unpack all of this. But everything you do today matters forever. So make it count. I'm going to ask you to stand if you would. I'm just going to pray blessing over you. You have so much to offer. And your heavenly Father sees the potential of every one of you to bring about beauty in this world, to bring hope, to bring encouragement. And he looks at everything, including a a cup of water. He wants his children to be able to experience something to look forward to. And so, Heavenly Father, may you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to the opportunities that are around us all the time to do good. May you burn in each one of us, God, the reality of heaven. Not just merely a destination, but truly a destiny that we were created for. Created to look forward to. Created to shape by the goodness that we bring into our world here. And to help people to see a glimpse of heaven on earth through us. And so, God, may you burn that deeply in the hearts of every one of your children. And may you, as his children, have a heart that beats strong for the future of heaven and for the opportunities to be able to store up ahead the good things that God, your Father, wants so much for you to experience. May you make a difference in the power of the Holy Spirit coming from a place of love and joy peace. And may it be so in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us today. And if our ministry has been a source of encouragement for you, let me encourage you to do two things. Number one, share it with a friend who needs hope. That would make a big difference in their life. Secondly, share it with us. We would love to hear your story. You can send us an email at amen at bridgechurchfl.com. And finally, if you'd like to partner with us financially as we bring hope both locally and around the world, you can do that directly through our website, bridgechurchfl.com forward slash give. And thank you for letting us be a part of your spiritual journey. 